starts on its own. <laughs> I also love that it gave everybody a 10 second warning. Isn't that great? I, I, I got all of my profanity out of the way during that 10 <laughs> seconds. Welcome everybody to another NovaFlex webinar. Today we have the wonderful guest, Don Kamarachka. He is many, 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 many things, but among them, a photographer, an author, and a filmmaker. And today he's come here to talk to you about his passion for an extreme technical and creative abilities for macro photography. Uh, Don, we're really delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Matt, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, and uh, I, I think you hit the nail on the head that there's there's a lot of technical uh, technical and compositional love, I guess, in terms of macro photography. I, I consider it to be sort of a mesh of two things. Uh, on one side, you have art, right? You have to understand rules of composition and why things are beautiful and lines and shapes and colors and color theory and all of that stuff that, you know, how that works in our head. But you also have to know the science. Uh, you have to know the technical side of things. And the more you can weave those two things together, I think the more magical the results are going to be. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, bring up the screen share for the presentation. And uh, while he's doing that, folks, remember, use the chat if you have any questions or if you want to talk to us in there, just drop it in the chat. And uh, Don will sometimes stop to answer questions along the way. And some questions we'll answer at the end. Thanks, Don. And hello over. to everybody that's, uh, that, that's saying hi in the chat. Great to see people from all over the place. Um, and uh, and so this is going to be a, a fun down the rabbit hole presentation. Uh, at first, I'm going to give you uh, an overview of some of the topics we are going to discuss. We are going to talk about water droplet refraction photography, how to make it simple, how to use new technology with your cameras and how to set up all of those shots. It's gonna be part of this talk. Um, we're gonna talk about ultraviolet photography, something that um, I have uh, kind of, <laughs> uh, I've, I've shined a light on, pun intended, to, uh, to a lot of people in the last little while, but there's some new material, some really creative ways for us to, to get into that as well as uh, creating your own subjects. Uh, we'll talk about uh, not only the water droplet creation, but this is some crystal photography that is unbelievably easy to get into and experiment and explore with that you can do with less than a day's work with stuff that you probably have lying around the house. We'll talk about how you can see the world entirely differently and how other creatures do as well uh, in, in that uh, ultraviolet space. And there's some, again, not terribly difficult ways to do it, but you might not have just seen how before. And we, yeah, we keep going down the rabbit hole. Extreme macro photography. Um, you know, uh, NovoFlex makes tons of really interesting equipment uh, to do extreme macro work. And, and I've had the, uh, the joy of playing around with some of that stuff. So we'll talk about all that. But we're going to start simply here. We're going to go back to some of the basics and, and think about, you know, why, why I might love going down these particular rabbit holes and, and how much fun you can have doing it. Imagine me uh, lying down near a, uh, a nearby hiking trail. You know, there's just wildflowers and stuff around. And I'm, I'm on my belly with a big camera and a ring flash and I'm firing off hundreds of photos of what any passerby sees as just a dandelion. And I'm, I'm sure they're thinking in their heads, well, why can't he do that in his own backyard? Well, I, I saw these beetles and those beetles to me were interesting. And there was a story and there was a narrative that I could, uh, that I could tell. And, and you got to seek those moments out. And I always try to, to impart a different view of the world, whether I'm uh, lying down on, on my belly or in the case of this fly, this is some really early work that I was just figuring out the basics on. Um, I could flip this image upside down or 90 degrees. I rotated it about 45 degrees to, to get the framing that you see here. But the idea was that gravity doesn't really matter. The stuff that matters to me in my daily life doesn't matter to a lot of the small world around me. Uh, in fact, this image, one of my favorite water droplet images, which we'll talk more about that, that subject in a bit, I had originally photographed um, in this orientation. And while that fills your screen a little bit bigger, it doesn't nearly read as well as the uh, the previous version in, in this orientation. Uh, this one just has a stronger connection to the subject and all of the lines tend to work a little bit better to our sensibilities uh, as, as human beings. So, you know, in that regard, uh, there's a lot of experimentation and stepping outside of our comfort zone, understanding that, you know, to, to photograph a flower, you don't need to photograph the entire thing. 
You don't need to be completely documentary of something in its entirety. You can look at just little things or you can try to tell a story and do an, an iterative process. And I always do an iterative process. This was one of my very first ones. I found this uh, uh, stand of Shasta daisies and they were growing up towards the sun. So I thought, you know, let's try to try to figure out how their, uh, you know, what their story is. You know, what's their narrative? Well, get underneath them. Look up. OK, this image doesn't work. The concept is sound, but the execution is not great. So how do I fix that? Well, look at what might be wrong with the image. OK, so um, I've got a bunch of vertical lines in a horizontal space that doesn't really feel connected. And they're growing up towards the sun, but the sun's not in the shot. So change the uh, orientation of the camera. OK, we've got the sun in the shot, but uh, it doesn't necessarily connect all that well with me. Um, if I adjust the exposure, which I can do in post, it doesn't save the shot. Doing edits in post uh, can make a shot slightly better, but honestly, the magic has to happen in camera. So how do we fix this? Well, get rid of some of the clutter. Uh, photography is often uh, the art of simplifying. It's a subtractive art form. So maybe if I put uh, the camera a little bit lower, this was taken during an era where we didn't have uh, remote connections to cameras and flip screens and things. This was over a decade ago. Uh, so I dug my camera into the ground uh, and shot uh, as low and as up as I could to get those flowers in behind the sun. And uh, this was the shot that resulted. It's, it's an art form in the sense that, you know, th this is what I imagined. But it's not what I see myself. As soon as I'm trying to operate the camera, there's a difference between how the camera sees the world and what I imagine the camera is going to see in that world. And it's all closing that gap has been, uh, you know, a constant effort. I, I believe in my career, but also in anybody's photographic career, is understanding how the camera is going to see things a little bit differently. But everything is seen different in the world around us. I mean, take a look at this this bee flying into this uh, gas plant flower, I think. Imagine how it sees the world so fundamentally differently from our own. You now you can see the flower reflecting in that bee's eyes. Um, I'll never be able to perceive the world the way that it does, uh, nor should I. But it's important to know that we see the world the way that it's useful for us as human beings. Um, but that's not the way the world is. You know, somebody sitting next to you is going to see the world differently. Your dog is going to see the world differently. A bee or an insect, obviously, they have entirely different perceptions. And so we're going to explore a bit of that. We're going to build narratives. We're going to see things. Now, this is... Uh, it was a fun experiment that I had done with a um, just a little bee on a nigella flower uh, with a daisy uh, type flower in the background. And this was early days. Um, and I learned a lot, but I would just string stuff together any way that I could. Um, there was uh, a lot of use of gaffer's tape just holding stuff together. I've since learned better. Uh, but, you know, some of the fundamentals were there. A black umbrella is portable shade, and I've got flashes at play, and I'm holding flowers in different uh, locations, and I'm kind of constructing a scene. Um, and it's not exactly documentary at that point, but I, I still do a lot of documentary work. Um, I'm renowned for my work with snowflakes. We're not going to talk too much about that subject this time of the year. I'm sure people are still enjoying their summer and don't necessarily want to go too deeply into what's coming in the winter months. But a lot of the uh, techniques and, and ideas and concepts, they're translatable. But that's documentary work. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But this might be one of the last documentary style images in this presentation. Because the goal is really to take control uh, of, of the variables, as many as you can to tell a story, to build a narrative. And, and I know that that's not for every scene and every subject. Uh, but when I'm putting my mad scientist hat on, um, this leaf cutter bee in this flower, to me, I love it. it you know, it's got a nice background separation. The focus is where it should be. Uh, it's lit with a ring flash, which is giving a nice diffuse light that doesn't produce any shadows, but that tends to work with this particular scene. Uh, and so there's technical stuff going on in the back of my mind as I'm trying to sort this stuff out. But the real creativity comes when I see this spider web, and it doesn't have any water on it when I see it, but I have a spray bottle in my camera bag. And that spray bottle ends up uh, making the shot. This was near a waterfall. If the wind was blowing in the right direction, I'm sure it would have naturally missed it itself. But you can take control of certain things, and you shouldn't be uh, afraid to do so. 
Uh, another great example would be uh, in the case of freezing soap bubbles that you'll never encounter in nature. There's no natural phenomenon that would replicate what you're seeing here. And I've got two different lights at play, one that's orange. If I just had that one, it would look bad because it would look like just a white balance error here. Uh, so I've got a blue light that's filling in the foreground and, and that works out really nicely. Um, and so that's created. I've created the subject. And sometimes you mix those two together. Uh, and this is a really fun example of kind of scratching your head and kind of putting some puzzle pieces together in your mind and playing a what if moment. There's a chunk of ice here that I've wedged in the snow. That is ice that grew in a mop bucket in my sunroom. And it, it was there because, uh, well, the roof was leaking. And so you know, I just kind of left it there all, all winter. And uh, it, uh, it accrued water and then it froze. But I thought, you know, I remember hearing that there's a particular phenomenon with crystals where if you cross polarize the light, there, there's a flashlight in the background that has a polarizing filter just taped to it. Uh, and if I put a polarizing filter on my camera and I view the crystal through that light, normally if you, uh, if you polarize light um, in, in both directions, but both opposite directions, uh, you will block all light uh, or most light. That's how a variable neutral density filter works. Uh, so it's just two polarizers going in opposition and things get really, really dark. But uh, for lack of a proper physics lesson, if something mucks with the direction of light in between the two of them, then it's going to escape the cross polarization and reveal some certain colors. You can take university courses to figure out exactly how light does some sort of fancy corkscrew dance uh, that we call birefringence. But we'll save that uh, for another day. We'll just take a look at the beauty that that can create. This is that chunk of ice from a mop bucket in my sunroom. And it looks almost like stained glass. And that revealed something really interesting to me. Uh, it was a concept of how you can explore some of these things. And it's not just ice that works with this. There's a lot of other materials that are household availability. Uh, yeah, I mean, you might have them already, or it's just a, a trip to the health store uh, or, you know, Amazon or wherever you want to buy some of these things. For example, um, this is another crystal uh, that I grew myself, and it's so easy to do. It, uh, when I say, oh, I'm growing my own crystals, uh, you just let water evaporate. Uh, that's all that's required. Uh, and this is uh, citric acid. And so too is this. The phenomenon is really easy to explore. Citric acid, if you don't have, uh, like I mentioned, health food stores will uh, will stock citric acid as a, I think it's like a food preservative or an additive of some kind. It's fairly common. Uh, and so you just mix that in with water and you place that on a microscope slide. I use a, a pipette, but you don't have to be as fancy. Uh, you can use an eyedropper or, you know, just pour a little bit on and wipe some off. It, just get something on a piece of glass. Doesn't even have to be a microscope slide. Take a piece of glass out of a picture frame that you're not using, that'll work too. Um, and you can test how this works. By the way, uh, what happens is if you mix a whole bunch of citric acid, or you'll see a bunch of different ingredients as we talk about them into water, whatever they're soluble in, um, when that water evaporates, at a certain point, it becomes super saturated. And it can't hold onto that ingredient anymore. And that'll start to crystallize around the edges of this creation. Uh, and so here's a fun, easy test. Uh, I just uh, pulled up my phone and I just uh, brought up a, a, a white screen and put a polarizing filter on top of that. Now, most phones are, uh, or most LCD screens in general, emit polarized light. And uh, if that's the case, then you don't need uh, a, a light source and a polarizing filter or any of that. You just need your phone. And if you already have a polarizing filter, just stick it on top. Uh, and then you can get this kind of construction. Now, there's a couple of setups that I use to shoot this. Some are more intense than others. We'll go over them both because I don't want you to look at a setup like this and feel intimidated um, because it is intimidating. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, but if we distill this down into something that's a little bit more simplistic, you'll see how all the puzzle pieces fit together. And so, uh, you know, you can see I'm using a 10 times microscope objective. Uh, you don't need that uh, for a lot of these. You can get away with less. In fact, you can get away with something a little bit simpler like this setup here. Um, I've got a, uh, a 100 millimeter 2X macro lens. And uh, that is the, uh, the the Liowa 100 millimeter lens. I love that 
lens manufacturers are no longer limiting themselves to that one to one um, aspect ratio. Uh, or not aspect ratio, uh, uh, magnification factor, which technically is where the word macro comes from. But why can't you push to two to one or 1.5 to one or three to one or just play a little bit differently? Uh, glad that that's happening. What you're seeing here though, there's a couple of ingredients at play, a light source in the background, a uh, polarizing filter, and then a special modifier we'll talk about in a little bit there. Um, then you've got that microscope slide and another polarizing filter in the foreground. So let's see what you can do. Like what, what is actually created when you see that through the, uh, through the lens of the camera? Well, you see something like this. Um, this was uh, NAC, which is some, uh, uh, I, I forget, uh, N-acetylcysteine, I think is what that is. And it created these really weird fern fronds of crystals. And I don't even know if this is like, reminds me almost like a palm tree versus some dragon type structure. Um, but that's what I was getting through exactly that setup. And so again, if you're using a, a higher magnification, you want to use microscope objective, it's all the same stack. You've got a light source and you're polarizing it. And then you've got your subject, uh, which is right here. And that's just a piece of glass and another polarizing filter on top of that. You know, some people would say at this point, Don, why don't you just buy a polarizing microscope? Because I don't need one. Because whenever I want to shoot this stuff, I can build it. Uh, again, light source, polarizing filter, your subject, and another filter. Now, the orientation of those filters is somewhat important. Um, because, you know, if you had a linear polarizer, it doesn't really matter. But most people have a circular polarizing filter. So the one on the light, uh, the lens side that's normally facing the lens of the camera, um, you make sure that that's facing the light source. Uh, and on the camera side, you know, I could have actually put it on the camera. Um, it was just held out in front as I was moving things about. But it's in its proper orientation. The lens side of the filter does face the lens. If you get one of those wrong, then it's not going to cross polarize properly, even though you'll You'll probably still see some colors. And so you'll notice a couple of uh, various crystal specimens on the table in front of me. This is this is a photo of me in my garage, surrounded by boxes of, of my new book that I was actively shipping out at the time that I took this photo, uh, which is still shipping. But I just mix up, this is me in total mad scientist mode, a bunch of different concoctions with a bunch of different ingredients to see what works and what doesn't. And so a lot of them didn't work, but some of them did. Um, this is um, menthol crystals. Uh, menthol, uh, which you can directly melt, by the way, its melting point is below the boiling point of water. So it's really easy uh, to melt menthol directly on a microscope slide. Just don't breathe it in. You'll feel like you're ingesting cough medicine. Do that in a well-ventilated area. Um, this is a health food supplement called beta alanine uh, that ended up looking like a topographical map of the ocean floor. But uh, you know, it's, it's just mixing this stuff up, letting it evaporate, and, uh, and creating some interesting artwork as part of that process. This, uh, citric acid. This one didn't work at all. Uh, it was a failure. This is vitamin C, uh, otherwise known as ascorbic acid. But um, why did that one fail when this one, also vitamin C, worked? Uh, different concentrations, different evaporation rates, different temperatures or relative humidities and things. Lots of reasons why some things work and some things don't. So I often have, you know, a, a dozen different experiments going on at any given time. And some of them, uh, like in, in example, this one, it did have some natural color. It did, but it largely underperformed. Uh, and so I thought to myself, okay, well, how can we change that up? A bit of research shows me you can buy one of these antiquated things called a quartz compensator. Um, oh, of course, it's written in French because it's from Paris. But um, this has a wedge of, uh, of quartz or um, other ingredients could be used to calcite. But uh, it would create a color effect. Uh, and if I were to put something like this in between the light uh, and the subject, I could kind of pre-colorize things. They're expensive, however. Uh, I, I've paid a couple of hundred dollars for a used one of these, and I don't want you to do that. Uh, and there's cheaper and easier ways to do it because there's a lot of birefringent subjects. Uh, if you're doing this just for the art of it, this is what I ended up using. Um, this is a little round piece of plastic that you see here. That piece of plastic is actually the cover uh, of a collector's coin. 
And uh, uh, by the way, small plug, that is my artwork on the coin. Uh, I have had two coins minted from the Royal Canadian Mint. Uh, so I had all these little bits and pieces uh, around. And so I took one of those little plastic shells and most clear plastic has a birefringent effect. And it was creating these wonderful rainbows of color uh, based on how it was injection molded or something. And so then if I take that same eh, semi-interesting scene and put that little piece of plastic in play, then it turns into this as a result. And if I move it around, maybe I rotate it a little bit or just change its position through the light path, I can get this as a result. The exact same subject, I'm just playing with the colors. Uh, it's abstract artwork part by nature by you know the crystal formation. I mean, you're formulating the crystal, so you take some credit there uh, as well. And, uh, and here's another. Uh, same uh, ingredients, just a, a different play. And so if you were to remember the previous setup of where things go, um, that uh, that little circle of glass just goes right there, right, right behind the subject. And this, this is fun because this type of artwork is something that many people wouldn't have otherwise thought to look at. Because this is just that slide of crystal in regular room light, not backlit or anything. But you can take this exact structure and turn it into some... I don't know, is this mountains and rivers combining together? Um, or maybe it's some sort of uh, desert oasis? Uh, or maybe it's something else entirely. Um, all of these different views are all exactly the same subject, just by playing with these different ingredients together. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I just, I love it. Uh, I could play for days with these kinds of setups, uh, these experimentation setups. Um, now, I am also, this image, uh, it'll transform in a second, trust me. Uh, but I'm also lucky enough to have colleagues that have access to uh, otherworldly subjects. This is actually a slice of a, uh, of a meteorite uh, that fell in Northwest Africa. Uh, and through regular light, it just kind of looks like a pea-stained rock. It's not anything impressive at all. Um, but uh, if I cross-polarize it, uh, and I create something like this, I'm really happy about it. And this was done with my makeshift uh, cross-polarizing microscope uh, using a lot of equipment from NovoFlex in order to, uh, to, to make this work. And, and you'll see some more behind the scenes as to how those types of images come together as well. Um, but I mean, keep in mind that uh, not everybody has access to uh, to meteorites, right? I mean, um, unless you uh, can borrow something from a museum or find something at auction. But there are a lot of things on a very small scale like this that you can photograph uh, from your own backyard, uh, or in this case, my front yard. Well, this looks like a coronavirus, uh, it is uh, nowhere near as small. This is actually a grain of pollen uh, from a rose of Sharon uh, plant that I have in my front yard. And uh, pollen up close, every flower makes a different size and shape and color to their pollen. So imagine putting a 50 times microscope on your camera to image some of these things. There's a grain of pollen next to one of those uh, micrometeorites to, to give them a sense of scale. Um, and another example on a very, very small scale, in order to create these images, I'm using um, a, a NovoFlex Castel Micro, which is their automated focusing rail. Uh, and I've used a lot of automated rails, but when you get to things the size of a grain of sand, um, the better engineered ones do perform better. And uh, and so I've, I've used three or four of them. Uh, the Castel Micro ends up coming out on top, but even the the, the manual rails, so long as they're well engineered, uh, work really well for, for these particular subject matters. Um, I call this one heaven and earth. Uh, it is a grain of sand from a beach in Oregon that uh, has faceted garnets, the size of, of grains of sand uh, and a, a meteorite kind of resting on top of that. Uh, so you had James says in the chat, scary pollen. Uh, it, yeah, it was a little terrifying if I didn't put it into context. In, in this case, uh, it's also a micrometeorite. Could, could you imagine shaping the light on something like this? It's not exactly an easy thing to shape uh, when you're trying to get transmitted light casting through something that's the size of a grain of sand, about a third of a millimeter across, uh, and reflected light off the surface. I make things challenging for myself, but we're about to get into things a little bit easier uh, that focus more on the creative side of things. Um, one more just for good measure uh, with the microscope setup that you uh, had previously seen, uh, the wing of a Madagascan sunset moth. 
This was just shy of a thousand shots. In fact, I think I set the uh, Castell Micro to take a thousand shots, but uh, I discarded three of them. I think it's 997 shots combined to create this beautiful tapestry of the moth, uh, moth wing uh, that used constructive interference to generate colors. It's really fun when the science and art world collide. Um, and that collides into this wonderful subject, uh, one of my favorites to explore. And this is water droplet refraction photography, which, you know what, you might not have access to all the big sciencey stuff, but that's okay, because you can do this on your kitchen table, uh, or in your backyard with ease without getting anything new, really, um, in terms of, you know, exotic plants. And uh, the, the flowers that I used often are, are Gerbera daisies. Uh, it's a blade of grass from my garden. The subject matter, per se, is pretty commonplace, including this one that I photographed just this morning. Uh, this is a yellow goat's beard, also called salsify, which is a, a root vegetable of sorts uh, that we can't even buy in North America. Uh, it's delicious, I love salsify. Anyhow, uh, the seeds have these big spider web-like uh, you know, seed heads, and they collect water droplets really easy from just a spray bottle, just like that. Uh, and this is, this is the behind the scenes setup that you see here which uh, it has a, a clamp holding the, uh, the seed, as you can kind of see in relative size uh, of, of these things, and uh, a flashlight. And so I've got a, a crab clamp holding the flashlight in place. These are on uh, little mini Novoflex uh, tripods. Uh, I, believe, I think it's the, the micropods. I can't remember uh, the exact names, but they've got a number of smaller tripods that are really handy and inc uh, incredibly useful different uh, ball heads that I love because they're accurate and they don't sag and they don't uh, drift around in any way. And they're really easy to pack up when I don't have this setup at play. Uh, so, you know, that, that gear just removes from the equation any, uh, no, no gaffer's tape is required sort of thing. I, I don't have to guess as to how this is gonna all come into play. And if you wanna know more about this, and we'll talk more about the water droplet stuff, uh, in in a minute, uh, Martin says that's the uh, the microstative uh, composed of the uh, micropod and the ball nineteen. Thank you. Of course, Martin uh, knows all of the stuff from Novoflex. Um, if you if you're at all curious to uh, to see my book on the subject, I figured I would plug that as well. Uh, you can grab a copy of that at uh, at skycrystals.ca. Uh, the prices on that website are in uh, Canadian dollars, by the way, if you're at all curious, and you can get $5 off uh, if you put in the code NOVOFLEX. And um, and that, uh, I think the Canadian dollar is at like 80 cents on the US dollar right now. So there's, there's some good savings there as well. Uh, and I'm sure that um, uh, Martin and, and Matt would uh, uh, would swear that this book is, is a pretty darn good publication and it covers all of this stuff and how to use it as we go in there. Um, I, I won't belabor that. I will share this slide again at some point, but remember that code is NovoFlex. Um, and I wanna illustrate some more fun images as to how we can explore and uh, and have some fun. And, and so this is almost exactly the same setup as the previous shot. Right, uh, I've got an LED flashlight, and I've got uh, that clamp instead. This time, it's holding a flower petal. And even from a regular standpoint, uh, from my own perspective, uh, I can see the refraction happening inside those water droplets. You can see it with your uh, with the naked eye. Like it's nothing, uh, you know, incredibly distinct uh, that only the camera can see. Now, how do you get those there? Well, you can spray them, but in this case, it's best if you were to use a, uh, a hypodermic needle. And that hypodermic needle, you can uh, buy, you know, various sizes of them on Amazon, especially those with blunt tips if you're worried about safety, I'd recommend that. Uh, but the, uh, the needle itself is hydrophobic. And the tip of that needle is, uh, you know, the, the water wants to get away from it. Uh, you know, I guess the term is like, it's, it's afraid of it in a way, like it wants to escape it. And so it's more likely to be easily placed very carefully um, on uh, on something like uh, a flower petal. And I, I believe, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's been asked in a uh, number of, I don't know if it's come up in this conversation yet, but um, whether or not the water is just plain old water or if it's glycerin or, you know, if there's some special concoction and mixture, um, just plain old tap water. I mean, 
I bottled water if I'm feeling fancy that particular day, but there, there's no difference. Uh, it's just plain water. Um, and some people will add glycerin to uh, to images like this uh, or to, to the water formula in order for the droplets to stick more when they would otherwise roll off. But I just find surfaces that the water wants to stick to. And so this is, this is that image um, straight out of camera, uh, except slightly cropped. And this was shot with the uh, the Tamron 90 millimeter macro lens. I don't even think it's their current one. I think it's an older version of it. Um, and there was a, a special secret in order to get this amount of magnification and this amount of focus in a single shot without having to resort to things like focus stacking. Uh, and this image was shot with ease earlier today in my studio. And, and I've done it before too. You know, this one has three drops. What if I wanna play around and, uh, and have five drops on this one? That's fine, I do so much experimenting uh, with these types of, uh, of images. And sometimes it, it doesn't work. A failed experiment from earlier today, this was some grass that had gone to seed out in the garden that was pretty ornamental and I tried to carefully place droplets on it that didn't work. This is probably the only time I'm ever going to show that image because I took it today and I had it readily available to show. Yeah, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. Uh, but you just got to keep experimenting. Other times experiments work. In this case, you have a, um, uh, a vine tendril from a cucumber vine and uh, carefully place the droplets again, one uh, dangling below. And the more spherical a droplet, the better it acts like a, a lens. And that's not to negate something that's non-spherical, like you've got this one that's inside this vine circle here. You can't really tell that's a flower. It's very distorted, but it's adding color and shape. And that has its own value, even if you're not getting a really clear look uh, at the, the flower through that particular droplet. And I went out to uh, was it yesterday? And I uh, grabbed this really gnarly looking uh, piece of a, a grapevine tendril that had been wrapped around something. And uh, I, I pulled that together and, and I thought, okay, well, let's try to play droplet architect here. And again, all, a lot of these images are done with very similar setups. You don't need a lot of equipment, uh, but those um, little NovaFlex tripods and, uh, and, and that gear is just so easy to use and, and rock solid. So I'm thrilled with it. Uh, but that hypodermic needle came into play where I was carefully placing all of these little droplets, all of them over this. Uh, and I would take a test shot or look at it on the back of the camera, maybe adjust one, change the sizes on them. Uh, and uh, at the end, I ended up, I, I think there's about 12 droplets in the final, uh, in the final image uh, that, uh, that resulted in, in this as that uh, final experiment uh, from this past week. And, you know, there's a couple of things that I, looking at this, I would improve. Uh, number one, uh, the Gerbera daisy in the background was smaller than the full-sized ones. The store just didn't have them uh, this week. So um, I had to move it a little bit closer. I didn't want to move it too close because any closer in the background is going to be sharper and in focus. Uh, but I have too much of a black border around the flower inside the droplets. I'd like to minimize that. And so a larger flower... Uh, would have been the better option. So yeah, you problem solve and you figure this stuff out. Um, and you know, I guess I have steady enough hands that I got, uh, it's four groups of three uh, in, in here, just carefully being a droplet architect, making sure that everything held, uh, holds itself up. And, and that's, again, it's just plain old water. And I've done the same thing uh, in a number of other occasions. Uh, here is some uh, flower petals also from the, I think it's from the same Gerbera daisy or the same bunch um, that I have placed in the background. Um, three different flower petals all together. And this, again, this shot, and uh, actually the previous one, I had to focus stack two frames on that one, but only two frames. And, and this one, none at all. The reason why is I'm using um, the high resolution mode uh, on my camera. And the high resolution mode, it's becoming more and more commonplace, is uh, the ability to use the, um, the uh, in-body image stabilizer uh, to shift the sensor around by sub-pixel uh, margins. And uh, the average modes will take between eight and 16 separate shots and quadruple the resolution of your camera. Uh, so my uh, Lumix S1R, uh, which I've been using for a lot of these shots, this one was shot with a, a Lumix G9, which also has the high resolution mode. 
But the S1R has a 47 megapixel uh, sensor that would then generate a 187 megapixel image. Now, I don't need 187 megapixels for most of the work that I do. I, I was using 20 megapixel cameras for most of my career. But I do know that one fundamental rule of macro photography is that the closer you get to your subject, the shallower your depth of field is going to be. Right? And that's why focus stacking becomes important at some point in the game. But if, if you instead, uh, if you get further away, then the reverse logic is also true, the greater your depth of field is going to be. And so you can kind of thread the needle here a little bit. Yes, diffraction is always going to be the ultimate limiting factor. Uh, so you, you can't get around that. But you can, uh, in many ways, uh, crop in on a higher resolution image. So long as you didn't shoot with an incredibly small aperture and you've got good optics uh, in front of your, your camera sensor, then you can throw pixels away. I can throw 90% of an image away and still have a useful photo that has a much greater depth of field as a single frame. So if your camera doesn't have a high resolution mode, maybe your next one should. Or if you've got that on your camera, a lot of cameras from Panasonic, uh, Olympus, Sony, Fuji, uh, this Fuji in the medium format anyhow, uh, they are now including those features. So if your manufacturer doesn't have it, complain to them because I'd like every camera to have those features moving forward. Um, I do lots of uh, different uh, plays, you know, this has a, um, an osteospermum, uh, some type of daisy like flower in the background with a blade of grass, uh, blue fescue, I think, but most blue grasses have a, a powder like coating on them that is also hydrophobic, it makes the uh, water droplets beat up and, uh, and not absorb into the blade of grass. And so that's always fun. And so I, yeah, I could spend three, four hours setting something like this up because I don't know what I'm creating. But you don't need to use, um, uh, you don't need to use just the, uh, the the flowers. What if I make a printed map of the Earth? And I think uh, Martin in the chat put a very good explanation to diffraction. And I'm not going to click on that link during the presentation, but I believe Martin may have linked to my own video uh, describing diffraction. Uh, and uh, I hope I did a good job uh, explaining that using um, a ripple tank and a laser and some other things. So diffraction is always going to be something to consider. Um, but this image of the Earth in a water droplet um, this is uh, a fun concept that I did back in 2012, decided to revisit this year. And uh, again, uh, the camera with a printed map of the Earth in the background, upside down, by the way, when things refract, they, they, they flip. Uh, and a flashlight that is hitting sort of the flower petals, but it's aimed more at the background. And, and that's uh, a key ingredient to keep in mind here. Um, and that resulted in, in this as an image where the earth is being uh, just, it's hanging by a thread. Uh, and in fact, if it drops, the heart breaks. So I thought that was a rather uh, symbolic image. Uh, and that's, that's again, that, uh, that setup. I absolutely love the, uh, the gooseneck arm that Novoflex makes. It's one of the sturdiest ones that I've ever used. In fact, recently I can't share behind the scenes images from it, but, and I can't even say what I was shooting, but I can say I was using that equipment uh, in my chest freezer in sub-zero temperatures and it performed like a champ. Uh, uh, everything was completely smooth and solid. Um, and you know, I'm using the, the Lumix S1R and, and nobody uh, except for Novoflex has any sort of extension ability. So they've got their, uh, their, their wonderful bellows, which is uh, basically a variable length extension tube, uh, dial it into whatever you want. And I was using the 24 to 105 kit lens to get that amount of magnification uh, straight out of uh, straight out of camera. And so sometimes getting close is better, especially when you really want to gather all, all the particular details. And that, uh, that made this image as a result. Water droplet refraction photography is something I don't think I'll ever tire of. You know, I, sometimes I'll add in live actors and, and do a lot of uh, you know, crazy adventures within that regard, but it's hard work when you do that. So start simple, start with just the flowers and the droplets and see where you can go from there. But that depth of field, that is a challenge, right? The closer you get, the shallower that depth of field is. Uh, earlier in the presentation, I shared a Madagascan sunset moth uh, portion of the wing. This is a single frame out of camera. Um, this is a single frame from part of a flower with pollen on it. So you've got two options to choose here. You can choose to do focus stacking, which I've done a good number of times, and I will continue to use. Uh, and it's very useful, especially when you get 
incredibly small subjects. But for things like water droplets, you can, uh, avoiding the limitations of diffraction, this is a single shot out of camera and uh, using that high resolution mode and cropping in on it in order to get this as an end result. And so I've got a lot of fun experimenting and exploring uh, that and knowing your technology, knowing what you've got at your disposal in your uh, tool belt of, of camera gear, whether it's in your camera as a feature or I've got a desk uh, in my studio that is just cluttered with equipment. I don't even bother sorting it out anymore because I can see it and I'm just going, I'll, I'll grab this or that and what have you. Um, so there's water droplet refraction photography. Let's, uh, let's switch gears again, because I told you we're going to cover a lot of different topics. And I know sometimes these presentations are like drinking from a fire hose, but bear with me, uh, because we're about to do more stuff at home. It can be a lot of fun. We are about to experiment and explore with ultraviolet fluorescence. And that means an image of this succulent flower like this is transformed into something such as this, uh, or this row of uh, impure diamonds uh, is transformed into this because impurities in those diamonds cause things to fluoresce under ultraviolet light. And, uh, and by the way, and just another plug, briefly this time, I won't belabor it as, as long as I did before, but if you did want a copy of my book that covers all the stuff that we've talked about thus far and a lot thereafter, uh, skycrystals.ca is the website, Novoflex is the coupon code, uh, and it would be great to get you guys a copy of that book. Um, and uh, I don't know how long I'm going to keep that coupon code active for, and uh, I did announce uh, previously that my family and I are moving to Europe, specifically Bulgaria, and I can't take the books with me and ship them from there. So if you want a copy of that, you got to get it within the next month or so before I uh, move overseas. But um, that being said, the equipment to do this is pretty simple. I've modified flashes in the past, uh, and, and those flashes, I don't recommend you going down that road. Uh, mucking with high voltage electronics is something I should never professionally recommend for a liability reason. Uh, you can do that, don't do it. Uh, flashlights, LED flashlights, they end up being, uh, to me, what works the best. Uh, and uh, and of course, be safe, uh, safety first. If you are wearing prescription eyewear, your, uh, your glasses almost 100% uh, will block ultraviolet light. And you can easily just take the flashlight and put your glasses in front of them and see if things fluoresce, see if it blocks the light. Very easy test to do, but protect your peepers. Um, here's a setup that I had done in the past. Um, and, uh, and again, that, that gooseneck arm is super sturdy, uh, and it's great for holding some of those bigger flashlights. Those flashlights, by the way, are Convoy, C-O-N-V-O-Y. Uh, they tend to uh, give the, the nicest, cleanest ultraviolet light source. Uh, and right out of camera, and by the way, the camera is stock, standard, right out of the box. Standard lens, no special filters, no special modifications to do this. Um, and the, uh, the image looks like this. And then when I turn off the room lights and turn on the ultraviolet lights, it transforms itself into this. And that transformation I think is really cool and really powerful. Uh, and I've done it with so many different flowers. Right now, sunflowers are, are blooming and every florist and grocery store has sunflowers. Go buy a sunflower uh, because that sunflower, I found one that was uh, sort of halfway open, one of the smaller garden ornamental varieties uh, and in ultraviolet light, it turned into this. Now what's happening here is your camera is capturing visible light. It's not capturing the ultraviolet light, um, but the ultraviolet light hits the subject and the atoms in that subject get excited or rather the electrons in those atoms do and they go to a slightly higher orbit, but decay pretty much instantaneously back down to their existing orbit. Uh, why am I going all sciencey on you? Because in that process, the ultraviolet light excites it up. Some energy is lost in that expansion and contraction, and the contraction will expel light energy back out of the subject, but it's at a lower energy. So the ultraviolet light that hits the subject becomes visible light, which is less energetic, that bounces back to the camera. So you are capturing visible light. It's just the original source of that light happens to be from the ultraviolet lights. And having a good quality ultraviolet light, I think is really helpful. If there's a lot of bleed through of uh, uh, a visible light, then it'll contaminate the light source. Now, 
there is a different type of ultraviolet photography. And it's one that is easier to explore now than it has been in the past, uh, but it does require some uh, slightly different specifics. The gear and the subjects can remain roughly the same. In this case, I've got some black-eyed Susans um, and, uh, and I'm creating a, a, a shot set up for that. But these flowers actually have a dark, uh, and like nearly black bullseye pattern where the center of the flower petals absorb ultraviolet light and uh, insects can see it and insects can be uh, attracted to flowers based on that and you can photograph the ultraviolet light directly and so this stack of flowers that actually turned into this that's that final um, image that uh, would be closer to what a bee can see. Now, bees also see the visible spectrum and, and who knows if they uh, are attracted to things in the infrared as well, but there are patterns in flowers that are hidden that we cannot see that pollinators can. Now to do this, you'd have to modify a camera for full spectrum photography, uh, which means that it removes the filters right in front of the sensor that block infrared light and ultraviolet light that our eyes cannot see, so it limits the camera to the human uh, visual spectrum. And uh, and then you got to put a lens on that has good ultraviolet transmission. There's some very expensive ones out there. There's some cheaper ones that might cost around $130 on eBay um, that also come with filter kits uh, that the filters have to block visible and infrared light uh, from entering into the camera. So just ultraviolet light comes through. If you're getting a camera modified to play around with infrared photography, for example, I might actually recommend that you modify it for full spectrum photography, because then you could play around with infrared with filters on your camera, but you could also play around with this kind of stuff with some modest additional investment, especially if you've already got those UV flashlights. Sometimes it's interesting, sometimes it's not. Uh, as you've seen in this presentation, there's a lot of Gerbera daisies. What happens if I try to photograph that in ultraviolet reflectance, what insects might be able to see? Well, I don't know. It does have some charm to it. Uh, it's got, uh, it's, it's wildly more textured. The, the center is dark versus the regular light being uh, you know, quite a bit brighter. So insects see the world quite a bit differently. Another flower from a recent bouquet. I forget exactly what kind of flower that was. It also didn't do anything terribly interesting. Um, a bedraggled sunflower. Uh, this is one of this year's creations that, uh, I don't know, it, it feels like war-torn in a way. And uh, and I kind of like that. Maybe there's some character that comes up from that um, or snapdragons. You'll notice some color in these images slightly as well, just like you can play with false color infrared photography because you can play with between you know 700 and 800 ish nanometers worth of uh, of light and remap that into the visible spectrum uh, from pure infrared. You can sort of do the same between 300 and 400 nanometers on the ultraviolet side, and so some false colors uh, can come in, and uh, you can play with that to uh, to add a little bit of uh, energy and life to what would otherwise be a black and white image. And one more from the recent experiments. Uh, these uh, were all done within the past week, just trying to uh, create some new material for this presentation. And I just have a heck of a lot of fun doing it. N no matter if it's a success or if it's a failure, this one didn't work out all that well. It's still OK, but it's not jaw dropping. Um, just the act of experimenting and exploring this stuff is a reward in and of itself. I've got so much, so much joy of doing that. And again, it's just a simpler setup, similar to this. And again, there is a, I haven't actually edited. I took the behind the scenes and I put it in here. I didn't have time to edit the actual photo that I was taking, uh, but that, that will come. Uh, I'll, I'll share that uh, in a minute here. Um, and uh, Gino asks, what, what, what are false colors? Um, so, in the case of, uh, in, in this image, we've got uh, a Shasta daisy on the, uh, uh, on the left is just how you would see it with your own eyes. In the middle is uh, the ultraviolet response, which really didn't have much of anything to. And on the right side is the ultraviolet fluorescence of that. Now, the ultraviolet reflectance image in this case did not have uh, false colors. It was mostly black. It was absorbing just about everything. Uh, but in the next example, this one here, there are a few little bits of false color that we are seeing come in uh, in the ultraviolet reflectance shot. This is a strawberry blossom. What, what a false color is, it's that the camera can detect a wavelength of light beyond human vision, which is between 400 and 700 nanometers. But 
if it's a if it's if it can tell that light coming back to the camera at 350 nanometers is different from 370 nanometers well we have no color for that because there's no color that we can see we can't see that light it's invisible to us but if the camera can detect differences there then you can remap that difference into the visible spectrum so that you can see some separation in colors but they don't actually exist. We're mapping them into our visual perception. So they're false. They, they exist once we've manipulated them for them to exist for our eyes to see. But normally we would be completely oblivious uh, to that fact. So um, that's uh, you know, that, that false color in general. And I love playing around with you know false blue skies and infrared photography and so on. Um, but, it, but in this case, we've got uh, uh, a strawberry blossom. And I thought, you know, they, they both kind of have merit here. The, the ultraviolet one has a nice glow in the center, but it's got a lot of distraction in the outer uh, leaves and, and petals and, and things like that. Uh, the ultraviolet reflectance one, uh, it's really cool, almost kind of feels gothic uh, in a sense, but also doesn't have as much vibrance and charm. So, you know, I shot these two back to back and I thought, you know, why don't I just push them together? and try to combine these two very uh, different ways of, of viewing uh, the world. And, uh, you know, the, the magic of altered perception. Now, this is not a way that anything could ever be perceived in the world, yet it is still what we're seeing here um, as art. Uh, you know, reality is subjective. If you've learned anything about this presentation, uh, you know, in a sentence, reality is subjective and we should not be bound by it um, as artists in any photographic space. So we have some we have some fun there. Um, uh, Bill asks in the chat, uh, I'm, "Am I autographing the purchased books?" You bet, Bill. Uh, they are being autographed. So anybody that uh, that wants one, uh, you'll get my signature if you buy it from me directly. Um, but going on to some of the other flowers, backyard stuff, stuff that just comes up in the early spring. Uh, normally, a dainty little white flower. Don't even know what it's called, and uh, and so it just turns into this. You know, I don't know if I could say cacophony, it's not exactly orderly of, of color, but I still like it. Uh, or this one, this flower is ugly. Um, it's actually uglier in real life. It's a zucchini blossom. Any squash blossom is probably the ugliest flower you've ever seen. Uh, but in ultraviolet fluorescence, then, uh, then you get to see that. Uh, hellebores. Yeah, this is a Christmas rose or Lenten rose. Um, the, the pollen, I knew this before, fluoresced vibrantly. And so I stuck one of those LED flashlights uh, up underneath this flower that's kind of curved down and, uh, and lit it up. In order to add atmosphere to the, um, uh, to the overall scene here, I, uh, I have a little uh, fog machine. There's a handheld fog machine. I think a company in the UK makes it. It's called a microfogger. Uh, and it uses vaping technology to just vaporize vegetable glycerin. And it just kind of creates this small little plume of smoke wherever you want to use it. Uh, and for a macro photographer, that can be all you need. You don't need like a massive industrial smoke machine. Uh, Succulents. If, if you have a garden uh, center that has a, a bunch of cactuses or succulents, check them out. Check, see which ones are blossoming because it's more than a 50% chance that the blossoms on that succulent are going to fluoresce. And a lot of my experiences with that have been exactly that. And some insects do too. We've had a lot of cicadas this year. Um, and I still hear them out in the garden uh, now that we're uh, sort of in the, the dog days of summer, which is why this one is called the dog day cicada. It's its species name. And these bugs are not going to win any beauty contests. But uh, if you turn off the lights and uh, I actually I put them on a this is a, a filter. It's a, I think a 900 nanometer infrared filter because uh, I have all sorts of strange things in my studio. It had a mirror like uh, first surface mirror finish on it. So I just repurposed that uh, and uh, shot him in ultraviolet. And man, from beast to beauty, when you see some of these bugs, it's just phenomenal uh, what can be created. And just always ask that what if question. And you'll encounter a lot of stuff that just doesn't work, but you'll encounter some that does, uh, including, uh, you know, not native to, to this area, but you can still buy them at, at garden stores is passion flowers. And passion flower blossoms are just really uh, ornate volumetric things, but in fluorescence, man, they turn into a colorful carousel. 
I also want to mention too, that if you have a focusing rail of which NovoFlex makes a lot of manual ones too, and they're great. Uh, I've got the Castell Micro, which I could use in this case to move the camera uh, slightly left and right not forward and backward, but if you mount the camera horizontally on the rail, so 90 degrees from the way that you normally would, um, you can get the camera uh, to move left and right. Why would you want to do that? Well, you can take a stereoscopic 3D image as a result. Uh, now, here's a, here's a fun test. We're winding down the presentation. I only have a few slides left, but I want to uh, test to see who can actually see this in 3D. You've got to cross your eyes. So uh, if you're near a big display, you might have to move further away. It can't fill your vision. You can't cross your eyes that much. But if you cross your eyes such that you see three images, cross them so that you get that much of an overlap and, until you see three, one in the middle, then focus on that one in the middle. And if that one in the middle locks into place, then you will see three-dimensional depth as a result within this image. Um, not everybody can get it to work, so don't uh, stress yourself if you can't. And some people, even after uh, a lot of trying, will never be able to get it. About only 50% of the population can do cross-eye 3D. But I figure I'd throw it out there and see, because you know what? Reality is subjective. Our reality as human beings, we are, uh, we, we, we see the world in 3D. We have two eyes. And so, uh, so few and far between do I see people exploring the way to properly perceive their art with that extra tool uh, in their toolkit. And if you could get that to work, if that was a possibility, um, then, uh, then here's one more, just for good measure. Uh, this is a freezing soap bubble forming in a flower. Uh, and c composing things in three dimensions is a lot different than composing things in two. You've got to take into account how your eyes drift around the depth within a frame. And um, I could do a whole workshop on how to do that. And very few people would uh, get it to work. But I'm glad that uh, Matt and Barry and hopefully maybe a few others uh, got that to work as well. Um, uh, Bill, I believe, did. So thank you for uh, for your indulgence in the experimentation. Um, and one more fun experiment. Um, uh, gooseneck loosestrife. It's a fairly invasive flower. We've got it growing and taking over parts of our garden, but I still like it, especially because it's really uh, pretty when it fluoresces. Uh, I'll walk around the garden uh, various times of the year with my ultraviolet flashlight and just see what's glowing. New bulbs that I planted in the spring, when they bloom, I'll check them out, see if there's anything new. And these flowers, they fluoresce like fireworks. And so I thought, okay, let's try to take some various pieces of gear that I have had around. Let's try to take this, um, uh, this geode. It's a geode that um, I have open on both sides. So I could have a light coming in through on the backside and the camera coming in through on the front. And I've got a lot of macro lenses, folks. Uh, this photo is actually outdated. Uh, I need to take another one <laughs> because there is just so much gear that I have collected. And finally, I found a use for the lens in the foreground, the Lyoa 24 millimeter probe lens. Uh, and uh, interesting fact though is it, it's got this ring of LEDs uh, right around the, the front of the lens. Now, there's no such thing as white LEDs. A white LED is just an ultraviolet LED that by various means, usually a collection of phosphors, will fluoresce into the visible spectrum. But that means you've got a lot of fluorescent material right there. And so if you shine an ultraviolet light uh, on those LEDs, even though those LEDs are not powered, they will glow, they will fluoresce. And that was an unforeseen consequence, but it actually turned out really cool. In the final image, uh, I had a nice orange glow coming in from, uh, from the front uh, that kind of filled in and uh, added some extra depth and dimension when I plucked some of those flowers and stuck them inside that geode as if those were blossoms blooming out of that crystal. And so all of that, uh, again, final plug for my book. I, again, it's just going to go up for a, a quick second. Uh, you can grab that if you're at all curious about that type of stuff. And please, you know, from that website, there's a contact form. Fill it out. Ask me any questions that you want about the NovoFlex gear that I use because I will recommend it wholeheartedly, as you saw in a lot of the behind-the-scenes images. Uh, and uh, and I would... Uh, I'd recommend you know anything that they make. The, the brand itself, I believe that there, there's no question that there is a price premium in certain things, but I am also a firm believer that you get what you pay for. Uh, and so that's, uh, that ends this wonderful presentation, uh, Macro Photography, The Universe at Our Feet. 
and I believe that there is a stream of questions here that uh, I may have seen a few of, but I'd like to get to them uh, as we uh, as we continue on into this bonus round. And if you have any questions, uh, this is the time for you to add them to the pile. Um, how does the water adhere at an angle and not fall off? Um, so some surfaces are sticky, uh, like in the title sequence here, the water is at all angles and it's just kind of being held on any wildflower seed, by the way, uh, works great for this, a dandelion seed, a, um, clematis seed, which has sort of like a singular spine and all these feathery bits on it, uh, holds great water droplets. Um, sometimes the surface is just sticky enough to hold the droplet in place, but not so sticky that it spreads out. Uh, and some flower petals work great for that. I know that uh, the leaves of a barberry plant, uh, the leaves of the lupin flower, a lot of bluegrasses, as I mentioned, there's just experimentation that you're going to have to go through to figure out exactly what works there. Uh, Donald said, is the spray bottle plain water? Or do you add glycerin? Well, we already answered that. So uh, yeah, it's just plain old tap water in there. And uh, I encourage anybody to experiment with different additives, but all the images that you saw in this presentation were plain old tap water. So um, Richard asked the ultraviolet reflectance method. Again, I think I kind of covered that one, but it's directly capturing the ultraviolet light, which requires a modified camera, um, a special lens that lets a lot of ultraviolet light through most glass, even a really expensive modern lens, uh, either the coatings or the glue that stick multiple elements together or the glass elements themselves will block ultraviolet light. So um, typically more vintage lenses actually let in more ultraviolet light than, than modern ones. Uh, Brad asks, in the UV photographs, are you just using the UV lighting or a fill-in flash? Well, that's the beauty of it, Brad. Uh, for the ultraviolet, whether it's reflectance or fluorescence, the answer is the same. It's just the ultraviolet light. Um, I could add fill, but that would kind of ruin the mystique of those images uh, in so much as the subject itself becomes the light source. Any light in the frame is coming from the subject, and that's really where, where the magic is. But I, I encourage you uh, to experiment. Matt asks, is the Convoy UV flashlight you're using a specific spectrum? I see 600 and, or sorry, 365 models when I search for it. And, and you are right, Matt, there's various spectrums of ultraviolet um, uh, light. You know, certain minerals, for example, will fluoresce at shorter wavelengths, like uh, closer to 250 nanometers. Don't play with that unless you're being very careful and you've got some cool mineral samples already, because that light is germicidal and dangerous. I mean, it kills things. Um, and uh, in my experience thus far, those shorter wavelength ultraviolet lights have not produced any fluorescence in anything organic. So 365 nanometers, which is a long wave ultraviolet flashlight is really what you want to be going for in, in most cases. Uh, Christina asks, do you have a preference on a solution to create bubbles that freeze? I do, Christina. It's in the book, by the way. Uh, but I'm more than happy to tell you it's, um, it's six parts water. Again, plain tap water is fine, uh, to two parts dish soap and use just the cheap stuff. Uh, I've tried to use like a uh, special, like green plant based soaps before they get really cloudy. They don't work nearly as well. Just the cheap, basic stuff is fine. So that's six parts water to two parts dish soap and one part white corn syrup. I believe in Europe, it's more commonly called glucose syrup. Uh, and that will not homogeneously mix with the others. It will tend to pool at the bottom of a bubble. Uh, and in doing so, it will act like a cushion when you place a freezing bubble on snow or any other surface that would more likely pop the bubble. Uh, so for freezing soap bubbles, that's the mixture, six parts water, uh, two parts dish soap and one part white corn syrup. And that is the golden recipe. I've used it for all of my freezing bubbles. Uh, Steven says, can a linear polarizer I uh, use for film uh, help in any way? Sure, it'll work just the same as it does. Uh, in fact, it'll work technically better than a circular polarizer. Uh, again, in so much as that you wouldn't, it wouldn't matter its orientation front or back, where with a circular polarizer, you have to put it in a specific orientation. A linear polarizer, you just don't have that consideration at play anymore. Uh, Jennifer says, uh, what is the very small device um, with the two clamps that you use to hold the elements of your photo? It's smaller than the Novoflex clamps. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, and uh, get a few of those from wherever you can. Hardware stores will often sell them. They're called a third hand tool or a helping hand tool. They're cheap. 
Uh, you can often find them for less than ten dollars. They fall apart. I, you know, submerge them in water and they rust. I leave some of them outside in the winter time and they're useless in the spring. Um, but a third hand tool is just a little alligator. It's like two alligator clamps on a swivel. Uh, and sometimes I've I'll use like three or four of them in various setups uh, to hold just something extra. Um, that doesn't really need the same level of precision uh, compared to the the Novoflex tabletop tripods and the the fancier crab clamps and and the other grabbing tools that we have that are often more delicate. Um, those alligator clamps, they're pretty brute force. Uh, they'll cut through flower stems and, and what have you, uh, but they end up being useful partly because uh, they're a, a cost effective measure. Uh, Lance says, can you give us more detail on the Convoy UV flashlights? Uh, yeah, so there, there's two models that I was using, the Convoy S2 and the Convoy C8, but I don't think Convoy is actually a brand because uh, I see them sold by a bunch of different people. Uh, you know, you can get them on uh, uh, Alibaba or AliExpress, but you can find them on Amazon. There are some sellers in North America. I think a lot of Chinese manufacturers just use that name, which buyer beware. Um, there was a company out of out of New Jersey or somewhere in the US called Midnight Minerals that I bought mine from. Uh, and they test their batches to make sure that they're, you know, top notch, they got the right diodes and the right filters and stuff. But um, I'm, I'm sure you'd get something useful, no matter where you get it from. Uh, Donald asks, are the insects alive? Or is it being uh, in the right place at the right time? All the insects that you saw in, in this presentation were live insects. Cicadas are relatively docile, I'm able to pick them up and put them down. Uh, and they'll stay put for at least a little while. Uh, the ant was the most chaotic actor that I've ever seen. I think there was a beetle at the beginning of the presentation, also much more cooperative. If you're working with insects, dedicate a day to a shot, and then you might not get it. Uh, because they just do not cooperate. Some people do put bugs in the freezer to cool them down. I generally avoid doing that if I can. I've done it once for one shot. Uh, and I've done it for some documentary work where they actually needed me to pin insects um, uh, for part of the the um, uh, the narrative that they were building. But uh, in, in that sense, you know, it's just, you, you do what the, the job describes, but avoid it if you can. Uh, and live insects work great. And uh, Jules says, thanks, uh, very much appreciated. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jules, for being a part of the presentation. And uh, I guess I will stop the screen share at that point and uh, say thank you to everybody that participated, uh, that asked questions and, and along the way, hopefully got some ideas, maybe a bit of inspiration. And I can guarantee you, you try any of these things, your first step will be frustration. Uh, that's a promise, but get past it because it is really worth getting past that frustration. Don, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Matt. I appreciate it. Wow. I mean, you were, you said it was going to be a fire hose. It was a fire hose. That was incredible. So I thought I was prepared because I'd read the book, uh, but, but wow. Um, <laughs> There's I, new I, stuff happening all the time. There is, there is. And, and where can people find out more about you, Don? Uh, my website is doncom.ca. That's D-O-N-K-O-M.ca. Uh, it's not updated frequently in terms of my portfolio, but all of my links on social media, where you can find me on Flickr and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, any new images that I take, including some from this presentation that I will be posting over the coming days, uh, will be posted there. So you can keep up to date with my musings on social media, uh, wherever I happen to be. And of course, skycrystals.ca is where you can get the book. But if I could plug one more thing and that would be my podcast if you enjoyed hearing me opine about all things techie photography then you might also enjoy photo geek weekly and that's found at photogeekweekly.com uh, and uh, i do a weekly hour long uh, usually a slightly more than an hour podcast about the happenings in the photographic industry uh, and it's enjoyed by thousands so hopefully you can be among them fantastic well, there's, there's one other thing that we'd like to offer everybody. Everybody who's made it all the way to the end, thank you. We've had a record turnout today. You guys are amazing. Um, if if you really were interested in getting some NovaFlex stuff, we send this. We give this offer to live attendees only. It's not going to be in the replay. Uh, I'm just going to send the offer out to you guys right now. Uh, you guys can get 10% off of one order on NovaFlex.com. So put everything that you're dreaming about getting into that one cart and then check out using the code macro 10 macr one zero yeah uh, uh macro 10 uh you know I, and i obviously novaflex is 
sponsoring this whole presentation and and I'm, I'm more than happy to use their equipment but I'll be completely frank uh, I wouldn't use anything else once I got my hands on a lot of that stuff. There's other things that work. Don't get me wrong. Uh, in the early on in my career, everything was gaffer taped together. It worked. Um, I would not wish to go back to those days. Thank you. I feel the same way. As soon as I, as soon as I touched a piece of Novaflex gear, there was no turning back for me. I was, I was like, finally, finally, I have the right thing to do the job right. And I don't mind doing a little DIY myself, but. There's some things I'm never looking back on. Just like you well, mentioned. also what I like about the, the Novoflex brand, if I may, is that there's a ton of niche products that they produce that I know will never be sold in volume, but solve exactly the problem that I have. Uh, and uh, I, I salute uh, the good folks at Novoflex for being able to, to solve those problems and, and make my life easier. Thank you, Don. And, and thank you for being such an incredible creative mad scientist. You inspire me. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully that uh, means you'll pick up your camera after this talk and uh, and go and experiment and find your own frustrations. Without a doubt. I love working <laughs> through my frustrations creatively. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I am. Uh, thank you everybody for the generous questions. Don, you gave us so much of your time. We really appreciate you. We hope that there's another time in the future where we can do this again, where we can see what you've worked on in between. So. Uh, and uh, two quick questions in the chat. Uh, Sebastian asks, does the code work for the German website or just the US website? Uh, thanks for asking that, Sebastian. This code is for novaflexus.com. Uh, but uh, Martin can talk to you uh, about things outside this, so uh, outside the USA. There you go. And uh, Lance says, who can we talk about getting help selecting equipment in the US? Well, you talk to Matt, you talk to Novaflex US directly, and you've got the coupon code now to do that. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Uh, this was a lot of fun. And honestly, ask questions, ask questions to Novoflex US, ask questions to Martin Novoflex in, in Germany, ask questions to me, we'll all be happy to answer things for you. Yep. And if you guys have questions about this um, and you don't know how to reach us, you can go to our website, novaflexus.com and the contact option there, or you can hit reply to any of the webinar emails and we'll help you out. So if you guys have a question about how to figure out what to choose, we're there for you. So, Dawn, you're amazing. Uh, I'm going to go back and reread your book now, and I hope that other people take advantage of it. Um, I mean, it's it's no joke. I got I bought this. Um, as soon as I, I, I was too late for the Kickstarter when I heard about it, but I, I bought it just after the Kickstarter and, uh, yes, it is signed. So I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to crack the cover on that again this weekend. So thank you, Don. Have a wonderful, wonderful, uh, weekend coming up and, uh, we look forward to seeing you again. So my pleasure. Look forward, uh, look, look forward to whenever the next one of these is, and I'll just have my mad scientist hat on between now and then, and you'll see some new things. Awesome. And thanks to everybody. We always appreciate seeing you here. Uh, we love seeing you in the chat. So bye for now. And until next time. There we go.